Hey, SoCap. So I love being here. And you know, as I was walking around today and I'd introduce myself and tell people I'm from Google, I always got the same question. So I thought, you know what, let's just get that out on the table. And you know what the question is, right? So is working at Google the same as that movie, The Internship? And so here's the thing. It's, it, it is actually very similar to that movie, but um, you know that Quidditch match with the interns? We don't do the Quidditch match, but we do do lightsaber wars, you know, in the summer with our interns. Well, as I have been out and about talking to our SOCAP tribe, you know, there's one thing that really comes across, a really common passion that we all share. And that is in so many conversations, people were basically trying to get to the bottom of this issue, which is how can I take everything that I have, my resources, my capital, what I can bring to the table, the best of me, and have the biggest impact for humanity, you know, regardless of the form, the format, whatever. Well, at Google.org, that's a question that we ask ourselves every day, basically. And we wake up and we think, okay, we've got the $75 million budget, but we've got 50,000 Googlers around the world. How can we best utilize those things to make the most impact for humanity? Well, when I first came to Google, one thing I learned very quickly is that Google is a launch and iterate culture, right? So like a lot of the tech industry, we throw spaghetti against the walls and we see what sticks. We, we launch, we iterate, and then we launch some more. So we have tried a lot of different approaches throughout the years to find the, the magic for us. And so I thought tonight I could share three of the lessons that we've learned at Google um, along our journey that have been relevant for us and might also have a little relevance for you. So number one lesson, and this one probably won't surprise you, is invest in the power of technology. So not surprising that Google's a big believer in technology, and we are, whether that's a self-driving car or even just a humble mobile phone. But you know that humble mobile phone, that phone that most of you have in your pocket right now, actually has more computing power than the computers that sent the Apollo mission to the moon. And access is spreading. There are now more people with access to mobile phones than people who have access to toilets. And once we get those phones, boy, do we love to use them. On average, Americans use our phones about 150 times a day. And if you're like me, it's like the first thing you reach for in the morning when you wake up, and it's one of the last things that you, you touch at night. And we've seen, you know, just thinking this month alone, thinking about the power that we've seen in mobile tech, you know, we've seen people who've held up their phones, pointed out to the world and taken photos and videos and organized protests in a place called Ferguson. And they've created a really important debate around race and police power. We've seen people turn those phones on themselves to take selfies and to, of themselves throwing buckets of ice water on their head. And in doing that, they've raised more than $100 million for ALS. Well, those are two examples just from this month alone. But you know, the power of computing devices is growing exponentially. And it's not just phones, it's in all sorts of form factors. It's in robotics, it's in wearables, it's in drones, it's in Google Glass. And what's really exciting is that there are tech innovators around the world who are thinking, how do I use these new technologies to take on some of our world's toughest challenges? Well, one of those challenges involves the African rhino. And uh, as you can see in this photo of this little guy, um, the African rhino is actually on the path towards extinction. So this is a, a critical issue. This is a crisis. Um, and they're on the path to extinction because the, the wildlife, the trade in illegal wildlife is actually at the highest point that it's been in 25 years. So an African rhino horn can uh, get about $300,000 on the market now. So that means it's worth more than its weight in gold. So this makes it one of the five most lucrative, illicit markets in the world. So the same kind of bad guys who are trafficking in drugs, in weapons, in human lives, are also trafficking in uh, wildlife. And you know what? They're bringing money and resources to the table, and they are also using technology. But the good guys just don't have access to that technology. And this is a clear case that without a huge leap forward, we're not gonna succeed. Within two years, rhino deaths are gonna overtake rhino births. 
So this is a clear case where we need to invest in experimental technology to help us come up with new solutions, new approaches. And these, this technology needs to work in places like Chitwan National Park in Nepal. So Chitwan is uh, 360 square miles. You can see some of the beautiful scenery here. Um, and it's wetlands and forest and mountains. There are no roads, so the rangers patrol on foot and on elephant, on the back of elephants. And you know, the, the bad guys I mentioned have the technology, but the rangers don't. And this is a very dangerous job for the rangers. In fact, around the world, about two rangers are killed every week. So this is a very, very serious problem. But the exciting thing is that we are working with the World Wildlife Fund, or WWF, on some really cool new technologies, including drones and including next generation tagging and even Google Glass. So we're still very early on in this project. But for example, with the drones, one, things we're one thing we're seeing is that, you know, when you um, have the drones up there, they're able to send data on migration paths and where the rhinos are feeding and breeding. And this helps the rangers to optimize and get themselves into the most critical areas. Uh, they're also developing next generation tags, uh, like wearables for rhinos where they're able to put on these low-cost, lightweight sensors that have GPS trackers, and then that information can be relayed in real time to the drones to help optimize their path as well as to the rangers. And then finally, um, a researcher there on the ground, Sabita, came to us and said um, that she wanted to try and use Google Glass because um, as she's going out and monitoring and tracking the rhinos on foot and on the back of elephant, it would really help her to take photos, to take videos, to get the data um, and improve uh, the work that she's doing. So this, this story of uh, the work that World Wildlife Fund is doing in the front lines in places like Nepal to save rhinos is a great example of our first lesson, which is the power of investing in technology. And one thing that we really love about this, this team at WWF is that they've been able to adapt really quickly to any curveball thrown their way. And that leads to our second lesson, which is the importance on betting the importance of betting on teams and then allowing them to pivot. So let me tell you a story about a nonprofit called Give Directly. So Give Directly was founded by a group of really uh, wonky PhD econ types. And um, when they first came to Google, they said, hey, you know, we have a really great idea for how we can take on poverty. We're going to give money to poor people. They're like, oh, OK. We're a little skeptical. Um, in fact, one of our executives um, notably said, um, you must be smoking crack. Um, but you know, here's the thing that really grabbed our attention. They're able to use technology, specifically uh, mobile payment systems, to get the efficiency to the point where they can deliver 90 cents of every dollar directly into the hands of the poor. So that's not 90 cents into, you know, program. That's 90 cents directly into the hands of the poor. Um, and with uh, this kind of efficiency, they've also seen great outcomes in the lives of the poor. The other thing that struck us is they're using randomized controlled trials. We hardly ever see this, you know, gold standard RCT in the field of development, but they've... Um, invested in RCTs, and they're showing that they're getting incredibly, incredible outcomes in the lives of the poor by just giving them cash and letting the poor make decisions about how it's spent, whether it's investing in businesses, uh, school fees, but they're seeing reductions in hunger, increases in health outcomes, increases in the number of businesses. Well, you know, the exciting thing about what GiveDirectly does is it accomplishes two things. On the one hand, it's a mechanism to channel a lot of money that consumers might want to give directly to the poor in a highly efficient way. But it also sets up a baseline. It sets up a standard that says to anybody who wants to, to raise a dollar that they want to go spend on behalf of the poor and say, just make sure your outcomes show that you can do more for, with a dollar than the poor could do with a the dollar themselves. 
So that's a really powerful uh, premise. And so we backed them, we gave them their startup funding, and we also provided engineers who helped to code their uh, back end. But then they came to us shortly after that and said, um, you know, hey, Google, uh, we want to make a major pivot. Because what we've uh, really learned as we've been doing this is that alongside the nonprofit solution, give directly, we really need a market solution as well. Because there are billions of dollars that are being spent by governments going directly to, p to the poor. But these are going through really antiquated systems. And, you know, think of these as pipelines with water going through and there's just uh, money just leaking, just leaking through uh, government inefficiency, through corruption. But by applying technology, uh, we could really improve the flow that gets to the poor in, in the tens of billions of dollars. So we were like, absolutely. So we have reinvested in Give Directly, um, but I think that they are a great example of the importance of funders acting like VCs in finding great teams, betting on those teams, and then allowing them to pivot. Well, one other thing that comes up from my story of Give Directly is the importance of data for us in getting us from you must be smoking crack to we will be your largest funder. Um, so data is our third lesson. And uh, for us, our mantra is let data be your guide. So you might have heard recently Google announced our diversity statistics. And if you didn't catch it, I'll just give you the headline. We have a lot of work to do. So across Google, we're about 30% female. But in our tech roles, it's even worse. We're about 18, 17% female, and about 3 to 4% black and Hispanic. So as Google um, thought about this problem, you know, diversity for us is a core human value, but it's also a business critical issue for us. Because we have done research on our product teams, and we have found that effective product teams have one thing in common, one top thing in common. And that is those teams have at least one woman. So it's absolutely critical for us from a business and a product perspective to increase the number of women that we have coming in who are software engineers who have majored in, in computer science in college. And as we looked at this, you know, there was some good news in that across the board, women are getting more and more degrees in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, degrees in college, with one exception computer science. And in computer science, we're actually moving backward. In the 1980s, women were getting about 37% of the computer science degrees. Now it's about 18%. So we're going the wrong direction. So as we looked at this and thought, you know, well, what are the key levers that are going to help get more women into college, majoring in CS, finishing computer science degrees? One thing really jumped out from the data as a key lever. And that's the importance of taking advanced, rigorous courses in high school in the math and sciences to prepare you for the rigor of college. So kids who take advanced placement or AP classes and AP exams and do well in their AP exams are much more likely to go to college, to actually finish college and get their degree, and get a degree in math or science. Okay, so we know that that's key. But then we uh, needed to think about how in the world are we going to increase women and underrepresented minorities in these AP classes. And this is a real problem because if you look across America, fewer than 1% of the schools have AP classes that reflect the diversity of their students. Less than 1%. And literally in 10, in 10 states last year, there were zero black students who took the AP computer science exam. Zero. And across America, if you look at all of the kids who took the AP computer science exam, only 18% were women. So you can see where the problems down the pipeline come from. Well, so we did a search to try and find a partner who was doing really good work in getting more women and underrepresented minorities into APs. And we found equal opportunity schools out of Seattle. So uh, EOS, uh, who was originally funded by Echoing Green, is doing amazing work in finding missing students 
they use data like grades and test scores and interviews with parents, interviews with teachers, interviews with students, then they take all of that data, they run an algorithm that they've created, and they literally find missing students. Students like Monica. So Monica, this is a, a real student's photo with another student's data to protect privacy. Um, but Monica is very typical. So Monica's the first in her uh, family to go to college. And uh, she has her test scores and the interviews show that she's a very high capacity student, has a lot of capability. But when you talk to her, she says, oh, those classes aren't for people like me. I wouldn't feel welcome there. And in fact, she literally did not even know how to sign up for an AP. So what EOS does is they use their data, they find students like Monica, they go and talk with her, the teachers, they get them into these courses. And here's the amazing thing. These kids like Monica who are selected by the data and put into the courses do just as well as their peers. And they are finishing their APs, taking the exams and doing well. They're going to college and they're doing well in math and science majors as well. In fact, EOS over the last several years has gotten 10,000 kids just like Monica into these advanced courses. So they're doing amazing work. And this really proves our, our lesson that it's important to let the data speak. So summing it up, if we look at our three lessons, number one, invest in technology, two, bet on teams and give them the freedom to pivot, and then third, let data be your guide. And then just one final thought, you know, um, it's sort of a personal reflection as I was thinking about lessons, but as I look back over my time at Google and the Gates Foundation and the government before that, I think one of the most important lessons is that innovation can and does emerge from sometimes some of the most unexpected places, even a village in Zambia. So a couple years ago, I was in Zambia. I was out there actually looking at clean water wells, um, and I just happened to cross this mobile charging station that had been set up out in the bush um, from recycled parts. And I found out it had been put together by 12-year-old Daniel. And Daniel at the time didn't even have the school fees to continue on his education. But he had figured out how to set up the only charging station that was available to his entire village. And he was charging everyone's phones. He was setting up the lights at night. So I think one of the key lessons um, that I've taken away personally is that we need to find the Daniels of the world and the Sabitas and the Monicas, and we need to invest in them because these are the innovators that are going to help bring us the kind of 10x impact that we need to take on some of our toughest challenges. Thanks. <laughs>